Well, good evening. My name is Ted Landsmark. I am a distinguished professor of practice within the School of Public Policy um, here at uh, Northeastern's uh, School of uh, Public Policy. Um, and uh, I'm also director of the Dukakis Center uh, for Urban and Regional Policy. And we like to stress that um, we are a policy school, so while we uh, look at matters of, of planning uh, and of uh, development um, and of uh, impacts uh, of different kinds of policy, we're really here uh, to learn about how to take good public ideas and translate those ideas into actual, tangible, manageable policies that improve the quality of life where we live. Uh, this semester, uh, I'm uh, again teaching the open classroom, uh, which will focus on, has been focusing for the past week or so, um, on issues of environmental justice, uh, particularly as uh, purported solutions for climate change um, have sometimes had the effect of um, doing bad things in many of our communities, uh, not just here, uh, but around the country and around the world. And over the course of this semester, uh, we will have a series of presenters uh, who will talk about uh, policy change um, and activism uh, within the realm of environmental justice as it applies not only here in Boston uh, but in other parts of the country and around the world and I'm very pleased uh, that our first presenter uh, is a colleague of mine uh, we go back a number of years um, when we get into dialogue, I'm going to ask her how she describes herself, uh, but uh, she will probably do that. But her title uh, is Executive Director of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy uh, here in Boston. And uh, without further ado, Karen, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me know if, uh, if I'm not speaking into the mic enough or something like that. Um, I'm really excited to be here and really excited for, uh, for you all to hear a little bit of, you know, a version of the story of the Emerald Necklace. There's a lot of different uh, stories, of course, and different you know, people's experiences of, of the Emerald Necklace, um, but you, uh, Northeastern is a wonderful partner and you, you know, go to school adjacent to the Emerald Necklace and you, I'm sure many of you walk through it every day and there's so many stories um, that I think hope will deepen your experience uh, as you're here in Boston and engaging with some of these, these stories that we're still in the middle of. Um, so I think I'm first just going to, you know, talk about uh, some of the, uh, the recent history uh, since 1870, being recent actually, um, and the, the creation of the Emerald Necklace because uh, many of you May, may know this, but some of you may not. Um, Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed the Emerald Necklace, um, was a, a really adept, uh, the first landscape architect in the country, it is, is one of the ways he's thought of as sort of creating the field of landscape architecture. Very, very adept in making things look naturalistic. So I think a lot of times people might walk around the Back Bay Fins or uh, through the parks and might actually think that that is what that land looked like um, originally, and uh, of course it didn't. Uh, and so I was a little bit about his life. Um, it's definitely something worth uh, noting. He had a very interesting life. Um, there were you know, things that are um, still being analyzed, I think, and thought through in terms of, of his legacy, uh, and that, that's important. But um, he, he also had, he came to landscape architecture fairly late in life, and he had done a, a few different things, including uh, running a, a sanitary commission during the, the Civil War, which sort of became the American Red Cross, and I think a lot of the work and the things that he learned about sanitation and sort of managing water and thinking about um, health uh, really show up in his work later, um, but also uh, he, being a writer and also extremely, um, extremely uh, knowledgeable um, in his work as a writer for what became the, the New York Times when he wrote a book 
uh, about the scourge of Southern slavery. And uh, really, that book is a very, very important work in, um, in the understanding of American slavery, but also um, really leads him to think about the ways that public parks can actually be um, a ground for a democracy and sharing of ideas and um, really creating a new American after the Civil War. So it's something to think about as we talk about some things that are later in my presentation. Um, and and I, I, just, just so you know, I went to Columbia and I thought that the, the earth rised and set on New York Central Park. Um, I, know, I know Professor Landmark also has a little, a little experience with that, but in fact, uh, Olmsted founded his practice here in, in Boston, and he, 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 uh, his office was in Brookline, and it's a national park site today, and uh, I think Boston doesn't brag about that enough, and I intend to as much as possible. Um, the, so to just talk a little bit about the, the history of the fact that a lot of times we create uh, parks and, and make other things as a result of public health issues, and it's very interesting, of course, the last few years, realizing how much um, open space and green space is so important to our own public health. Um, Olmsted essentially solved a public health problem through the creation of a park, and I don't think a lot of people um, maybe always know that, but this map, which is my favorite map that I have come across in Boston so far, um, uh, shows uh, the areas of offensive odors uh, perceived in Boston in 1878, and uh, this is, um, I think this is from the Leventhal Map Center collection, but it's also on view at our visitor center. So if you ever want to come and stare at some maps, um, we have an exhibit in the Shattuck Visitor Center very close to here. So essentially, this is a map that shows how over time, of course, Boston was filled in. And, and at the turn of the century, there were not modern sanitation facilities. There weren't um, you know, those kinds of, of tools that were developed later. It wasn't Boston was particularly behind. Um, you know, this, is, this is the case in a lot of places. And uh, the way that, that um, the city was expanding and just filling in what had been uh, water or marshland uh, didn't really, didn't make for, um, a, well, a nice place to, to, to breathe. Um, and over time, um, this had to, had to be corrected and Olmsted was someone who responded to that challenge. And he essentially took, um, took this area of uh, stagnant, um, you know, sort of a tidal estuary that was still tidal because the Charles River Dam wasn't there yet and shaped what is today the Back Bay Fence. And so we're, we're kind of just off, just off the side there uh, as we are here in, in, in um, at Northeastern's campus. And one thing that I always, I think is interesting in you guys, because you're right beside it, I wanna just point out, this is the original configuration of the Back Bay Fence, which today, uh, when you walk across it, actually has got a ball field and a rose garden and uh, a lot of actually solid ground. But at the time, it was, it was much more of a, of a system of, of marshes and waters that would clean and treat water and stormwater runoff, just like today we're trying to do everywhere. So you, this was the first piece of green infrastructure that was really designed to do that. Um, and so we think that these new things are, are so new, but they actually aren't. Um, but I, I think it's kind of funny because it does kind of look like a stomach, doesn't it, a little bit? Anyway, but that's actually what it is. Nature actually has these systems that can take care of uh, water, can clean it, can treat it if we just sort of allow it to do uh, what it does. And Olmsted really knew this and built those, those, uh, those methods into, into the park. Um, since, since the creation of the Emerald Necklace at the turn of the century, um, you know, of course, times change and uh, tastes change. And cities have gone through a whole lot of tremendous change, and I'm sure a lot of you have studied this. Um, one of the things I recently wrote was a paper um, that I presented at a conference called Mitigating Mid-Century Modern uh, Mayhem, because uh, that is sort of the history of a lot of cities, but certainly the history of the Emerald Necklace. And I'm gonna talk a couple, of, just a couple of the things that have changed um, or will change or should change um, that are related to things that were uh, generally done because of the car-centered nature of uh, development and of, uh, of essentially you know, the capitalism in, in, at this time and the way that uh, spaces are structured and uh, certain, certain folks are, are given uh, dominance over, uh, over spaces, essentially. Um, so the first place that I think I'm going to, uh, to, to point out is, um, oh, today I think it's called uh, Time Out Market. 
I see nodding faces. So it, that was the Landmark Center. It's gone through a few names. Uh, and it was originally a Sears Roebuck um, distribution center. It kind of looks like that, if you, if you notice. They all kind of look the same. And um, uh, that, so this is basically a across the street from it. And today it is actually a park. Um, but it had gone through uh, a few different uh, histories. It originally was built, and, um, and there, there's, there is essentially the, the new waterway, but it had been an open river. Then in the 1950s, Sears and Roebuck said that it would leave unless the city provided more parking. The city put the river into a pipe and built a parking lot there. And then in 1996, there was a huge flood. I, have some picture, I think I have some pictures in this I can show you. But there was a parking lot I, I like to always remind everyone, they still left. Sears still left, despite having a parking lot. Then we had like a just sad parking lot, and we had the pipe, the river in a pipe, and rivers don't like being in pipes. And, um, and, and you know, decades of, of probably not enough maintenance and not enough care, and it led to, to this. Uh, in 1996, uh, when essentially there was a, a few different events, a lot of rain and a, qu a, quick, a quick interval, um, I think that the Charles River Dam had the water really high because there was a regatta. There was just a, a whole bunch of things came together, and this happened. So, um, the uh, this is the Kenmore T, the Green Line shut down entirely. And you know the good news is, I guess, that there was a, there was a, there was a good amount of financial damage, and you can use that to sort of motivate change. Unfortunately, that's sometimes what it takes. And in 1996. Uh, when this happened, it became clear that there needed to be an organization like the Emerald Necklace Conservancy that would bring together all of the groups and park organizations up and down the Emerald Necklace and think about it as a single thing. Because one thing I, I didn't mention, oh, here, here it is today, see? So it was a park, then it was a parking lot, and it was a park again. So it's gone through the whole Joni Mitchell song, like forwards and backwards. Uh, only certain people of a certain age. Anyway. Um, but this is, this is what it is today. So some of you may have seen it you know, go through these changes, but it's, it's a very interesting thing that something can actually go through that kind of an arc. And uh, today, um, there, the, the Muddy River Restoration Project that's being done right now, which is a project of the Army Corps, um, which the advocacy started for that in basically 1996, and it's still in construction, um, is bringing back that flood capacity so that, that the, the river uh, the Muddy River, the, the whole system can hold the stormwater that it needs to in order to essentially, um, you know, protect all the developed land around it, because essentially that's that's what this was designed to do, and, um, that, and that's essentially what they're doing. Uh, over time, there have been Phragmites and a lot of other things that have grown in and sort of narrowed, narrowed the space that the river really has to properly uh, control the things it needs to control. So um, that's an ongoing project. If you have more questions about it, happy to to touch on it. Um, so the Emerald Necklace Conservancy really started then as uh, just a group of all of the organizations up and down the necklace, heavy concentration of organizations in the Back Bay Fens, because that's where the flood was, I think, is one of the main reasons. Um, but also reflects something about, I think, the organizations with time, energy, and you know, resources to be involved, too. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, here are some of the projects that we've worked on. They're restoring uh, the, Rose, uh, the Rose Garden, which many of you may know, uh, which was not an Olmsted design. Olmsted was actually not really into flowers. Um, he thought that this looked funereal, you know, flowers and statues and things like that. He thought that resembled death. And he thought that we should have things that look more naturalistic. So that's, you know, his, his work would be more, um, more in line with sort of what you would encounter in nature if nature looked great all the time. Um, there's a series of, of seven parks, and the, the Emerald Necklace Conservancy works with the three public property owners. Actually, it's more like five now, but the town of Brookline, the city of Boston, and the state all own sections of the park. Plus, we have a little bit of the MBTA and MassDOT, and so these, all these organizations are part of my job. And I, I used to work for uh, city government in New York and in San Francisco. A lot of my job and our team's job and, and uh, Professor Landmark serves on the board. He's one of the one of the the people that help us, uh, you know, as we think about how best to tackle these problems. Is really about bringing all of those organizations together to align and um, and do the projects and the work that needs to happen. Um, so this is a there's a picture of the visitor center and sort of the different kinds of things that we do. Um, please uh, feel free to to. Uh, learn a little bit you know, more if you'd like to um, on our website or come check us out at the visitor center. Um, I'm gonna talk, you know, these are some of the locations where 
uh, along the emerald necklace, generally because of the, the, the dominance of uh, the combustion engine uh, and cars that we have, um, we have mainly focused on. So I'm gonna show you a couple of those things that have changed. Um, and you can also, um, you know, again, look more online if you'd like to learn a little bit more about these things. But over the last few years, there's actually been some pretty significant things that have improved the access and I think the pedestrian and the bicycle access of these, these different sections of, of the park. And I think uh, the point that Professor Landsmark made at the beginning about, you know, how much of these improvements, um, you know, how, who, is, who is deciding what the improvements are, um, how those improvements might serve some communities or other communities, how they relate to property value, how they relate to um, what type of resources uh, should be provided in any given park, I think is a really great question. Um, and, it's, and it's been a challenge, I think, for the work I've done in, in every place, actually. So there was originally an elevated, high, an elevated overpass in the area of the Casey Arbor Way, and then that has come down. Um, this is a project we're currently working on, which is um, a part of the park that was really, I mean, I mean almost completely destroyed um, based on uh, two, two major um, highways, uh, both the Balker Overpass and, and Storo Drive. Um, this is what the Charles Gate area looked like before um, highways were put on top of it. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this area, but essentially it is the area that between the Charles River and the Back Bay Fens um, where Commonwealth Avenue and Beacon Street sort of all come together. And today this is an area that you, you walk really fast, you know, you don't, there's really not nothing to do there. There's, there's no benches. We have put out some cheery red chairs and actually this weekend we're gonna have a great event. So I will uh, leave some flyers here all, throughout the whole necklace, but also at Charles Gate. We really are investing in this site, but it doesn't offer a tremendous amount for the visitor today. Um, this is, this is the, uh, the, the place that um, as it looked up until the 50s, and then uh, essentially, um, you know, like all, like a lot of cities, a lot of other parts of Boston, um, the powers that be using uh, transportation dollars, um, or also sometimes schools, hospitals, prisons, these kinds of things were often built, and instead of acquiring new land to do that, uh, parkland was sort of seen as free and already available, and so that's where uh, the, uh, the interstates or highways or roadways were put, um, often through neighborhoods that were not considered, uh, quote, as important, and often uh, neighborhoods of color, not, not always, but uh, quite frequently. And so today, this is the experience of the Charles Gate Park. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a group of uh, preschoolers that have to, um, have to walk over the, the overpass every day to get to a playground. Uh, we do not stage them, they just do that, actually. Uh, and the, the Muddy River, which does actually connect to the Charles, but you don't see it because it's in a pipe uh, that goes under Storo Drive, uh, the last 250 feet of it, anyway, um, is the, the, um, the poorest rated tributary to the Charles, mainly based on E. coli. Uh, we don't know if it's geese E. coli, human E. coli, or dog E. coli predominantly, but still E. coli, bad. So we're all trying to work to improve that. Um, this is sort of some of the, the possibilities that we have um, looking forward into trying to reverse some of what happened there. Um, I think more and more people are looking at these spaces that are under overpasses and seeing what the possibilities are. Um, so this is, we're looking at putting in a playground or a dog park, these sorts of things. And there's a lot, um, a lot to be done. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting is right now, a lot of the infrastructure that was put in in the 1950s is actually reaching the end of its useful life. Of course, A.J. Richardson stuff seems to last a whole lot longer than that, but the, uh, the concrete stuff that was built in the 1950s is, is falling apart. So two of the worst bridges in Massachusetts are located in this project area, which is great news because it means that someone is going to spend a lot of money uh, renovating these bridges and maybe it can be done in such a way that pedestrians and, and others can be, can be safer. So these are some of the, the images of some of the work that we are working around right now to better connect um, uh, the, uh, you know, these, these waterways and these parks. So you could actually, again, you know, go from here, from Franklin Park, you know, to the Esplanade or from the Esplanade to Franklin Park and sort of connect through the entire Emerald Necklace. Um, there are possibilities of relocating roadways and um, doing other things like that. This 
this here is um, is a location that we aren't we aren't not yet as successful as we have been in sort of the advocacy around uh, the Charles Gate area. But this uh, is a currently a conversation that we are we are deep in, um, trying to take um, a possibility of restoring open space now that there's a hospital that was located in Franklin Park in the 1950s. Uh, by the by, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts took a big hunk out of the park, and uh, today the state announced that they not today, I guess three years ago, the state announced that the hospital was too expensive to renovate, so they were going to just build a new facility in a different location in the South End, uh, and the that the that that site um, could be used for something else. Um, the state also put together a plan uh, for housing for the formerly homeless and other other uses and so we are right now trying to see if there's some way that we can find other other opportunities for these really important things housing for the formerly homeless those services and then also get the opportunity to restore 13 acres to to this park and so just to sort of show you some of the the analysis of the communities that Franklin Park serves they are predominantly uh, the communities that need open space most we know from research that um, Low-income communities, communities that have uh, less time and resources to travel, n neighborhood parks are more important. I mean, this is kind of logical, but you have to sort of, re you know, remember that if you if you if you have limited time with your family, um, limited resources, you don't have a car to go, you know, wherever, take that kind of time. Having neighborhood parks, both for health, um, for air quality, for all the things, are, are so important. So this opportunity is a really um, important one, and. Uh, Let's see. Uh, and, and also we've been doing some analysis of just sort of showing how much of Franklin Park is not really free and open all the time to people already. The zoo, the golf course, these kinds of things. Because I think this, this is some of the, just the work that you do when you're trying to explain <laughs> sort of the, a policy goal as simply as you can to, to folks that of course you know, want to make sure that we have all the, all the services that we need. That's a lot of, I think, the, the job that um, we try to do at the Conservancy is sort of find uh, opportunities for making all of these things uh, work in the same, you know, and, and satisfy all the needs. I think I'm going to not dwell a lot on the details of this, but um, but it has been a it's it's a long and important conversation as we talk about how we could potentially provide those services um, on another site that's just outside Franklin Park and also owned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the Emerald Necklace Conservancy and many of the, the community members and others that we've been working with have had the, you know, the radical, the radical idea that two state agencies could coordinate and co-site, co-locate um, both an electric bus facility and all the services. And that's something that is an ongoing conversation. Um, and uh, and it's, you know, it's it's been it's been really fascinating some of the conversations around this. You know, certain neighborhoods were more involved in the conversations, and other neighborhoods were less involved in the conversations. Uh, as the state um, has been you know, doing its work. And the state never, never evaluated alternative you know, other sites just to you know, sort of make sure this was the best site. And uh, you know, it's just been, it's been unfortunate because I think if it had been any other, many other sites, they would have been, they would have. Uh, I think we also are dealing with a lot of major challenges in our city today, in a lot of cities. So we, we also wanna find these easy, quick solutions. Unfortunately, many of them aren't easy or quick. I've been really, really thankful that the Northeastern students in uh, the graduate program with uh, Professor Landmark and others' leadership has provided us some uh, essentially assistance in sort of creating visions to remind people that there's a lot that you can do if you have 19 acres um, just outside the park, too. And to, you know, showing people that a bus facility could have other things located in and around it because today we're doing electric buses. Uh, we need electric buses because of uh, air quality improvements uh, that electric buses bring, and see if there's ways to co-locate other types of um, other types of facilities, other types of development uh, that could, you know, provide for a lot of these needs that we need. Try and this is some this is an analysis that we've been trying to do to remind people that actually both projects are working along the same time frame. So if the guy one hall and the other guy could like coordinate, it'd be really awesome. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on, and I think Professor Landsmark and I are, are going to spend some time um, talking about more, is that um, the Emerald Knuckles Conservancy, um, we've been very involved with thinking about um, the bicentennial of Olmsted's birth. So he would, this year is the year he would be turning 200, and how, how best to mark that, uh, how best to recognize the work here in Boston. And as we were starting to plan it, we realized that we were in a room with 
almost entirely white people, uh, almost entirely sort of folks from the sort of landscape architecture world, and, um, but we really, we really weren't talking about the planning with all of the communities that we needed to and wanted to in the process. So um, we started thinking about, you know, how could we do this? And it was right when COVID was starting and we were in this, you know, a very, um, you know, strange space, but we knew that parks were just so much more important, you know, always have been important, but even more recognized. And um, we essentially started working with uh, a, a leader uh, that I think Ted and others introduced us to, um, Stephen Gray, who's a faculty at, at Harvard, and he helped us think about how we might um, how we might really do something different with this, and not just recognize or sort of celebrate the, the designs of Olmsted, which of course are, you know, masterful, but think about, um, you know, what are the what are the principles that Olmsted's work brought uh, in terms of shared space um, and shared health. And so now we've been working with a coalition of organizations all across Boston, and sort of focusing on those those shared principles that his work. Brains. And these were the ones, as we started to work with community members all over Boston, uh, that we felt like really, um, really brought to the fore uh, what we wanted to try and recognize this year. Um, and, you know, public health, shared health, shared power, these, the, the things that this democratic space can, can do for us. And it really felt quite uh, powerful, actually, um, you know, during the last couple of years about sort of how we could sort of rebuild and, um, and, and also cede uh, power to other, um, you know, others that, that haven't been as involved in the conversations about um, space and, and, uh, and, and spatial equity, essentially. Um, there were a few studies that Stephen did um, that were really helpful. Um, number one, looking at uh, our park advisors. So we have a board of organizations that, you know, provide us feedback on projects and come to meetings and talk about access improvements. And what we were learning is that you know many of them were very much located around the Back Bay Fens, which is where we originally were founded. There was a flood, but not as many uh, in the Frank Franklin Park area. But then, of course, we realized those are the communities that we wanted to really make sure were you know most connected to our work. So how could we, you know, change um, you know change that? This is an analysis that Stephen did that sort of showed us where you know BIPOC populations, um, where uh, elderly. Uh, and other populations that we really want to serve, where, where was the greatest park acreage, and how is representation working on our uh, park advisors. And what we, you know, the Franklin Park Coalition is an amazing organization. It's been around actually longer than Conservancy, definitely been represented, but, you know, we need to weight that differently. We need to provide more opportunity and uh, change kind of how that works. So um, one, one, one thing that, um, that Stephen recommended um, and my, the board embraced, uh, really happy that the board not only embraced but we funded for this year, was the creation of a committee of neighborhoods. So community leaders from, uh, from the communities in and around Franklin Park, predominantly but not exclusively, um, and also really recognizing the fact that uh, folks coming are expert in their neighborhoods and in their work and should be compensated for their time and their work. Uh, a lot of times we expect people to come to meetings and be volunteers, but you know it's you know it's time and it's money, and a lot of times in these kinds of public meetings, the only people that are I'm quoting Stephen now, the only people that are actually being paid in the room are the architects and everyone, and not the community. But the community is really an expert in in their in their neighborhood. So how could we um, both um, empower, um, but really have those folks be the decision makers in this year and in celebrating this year? So. Um, this is the, these are the organizations that were represented in the Committee of Neighborhoods. We asked people if they wanted to be involved, and a lot of people did. Um, a lot of the meetings did have to happen via Zoom because a lot of this planning was during COVID. Um, and we, we asked people kind of what, you know, what they, they were interested in. What we ended up creating was a fund that the committee would decide how to distribute to organizations and others that um, through a grant process um, that would provide for um, programming, perhaps existing programming that's really effective or new programming uh, in and around um, all of the parks in Boston, uh, not just the Emerald Necklace. And, um, and these projects are actually going on now, so if you want to see them, there's a ton of things online that you know, can show you all of the events that are happening through the end of October. We have one in the Emerald Necklace on Saturday, but there have been projects in East Boston uh, and throughout um, the neighborhoods 
And it's been very, uh, it's been a really, really interesting process. And I personally love that I ha didn't have to decide which projects got, got funded and which didn't. It was really wonderful that uh, community-led effort really made those uh, determinations. Um, so it's been, I, I think not only is it sort of changing um, actually the composition of our leadership, new members of our board, new members of the board of advisors, but it's also, I think, uh, introducing us and uh, sort of making new relationships and uh, empowering, um, you know, I think new, new ties so that new projects will have, um, you know, different, different essentially voices as part of them. Uh, here's some of the projects that are going on. There's, uh, uh, there's a project uh, with James Baldwin in the park, which is coming up. I'm very excited about. Um, so here's just here's a map of some of the other projects. Um, I think I might uh, wrap up. So if you wanted to, to talk, I don't know if you wanted me to keep going. I don't know how much time. Your time is good. It's good. Okay. Um, so this is this weekend. Uh, where this is the Park Fest uh, event that's happening this weekend, um, Saturday through the Emerald Necklace from Charles Gate to Franklin Park. Um, please uh, please feel free to to come out and experience it. Um, and then, of course, like I was saying, on the Olmsted Dow website, which is the name that uh, the, the project really came to at the end of the day, um, on the Olmsted Dow website, you will see events that are happening throughout Boston, not just on the Emerald Necklace. Um, and here's just some photos of some of the events that have happened uh, so far that were decided by the Committee of Neighborhoods. So um, that, I think, concludes my presentation. And uh, I hope... Uh, We'll have a we'll have a conversation now. Let me start with a, a basic background question. Um, how did you get to be who you are? Right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of folks uh, want to get involved in activities that involve uh, the environment and improving things. Yeah. Absolutely. Who are you anyway? <laughs> Yes, so, and then I got this crazy funny last name. Um, so uh, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, down the street from some Olmsted parks. Um, and uh, there were, uh, in my, ch it's funny, because you know, I didn't, I only read this backwards, I didn't read it forward. But uh, there were, there were uh, plans to build a highway and go through the, the downtown parks that I grew up uh, playing in, uh, and right beside my, Atlanta Public School, elementary school, and my parents and a bunch of other community members um, fought to save that park. Uh, and so uh, there was definitely something, something in my history that, about this work. Um, I, uh, I studied architecture um, in a college uh, at Columbia, uh, down the street from Central Park, and then had a really wonderful privilege to work for the New York City Parks Department for four years and work on Olmsted Parks um, and many, many other parks, uh, parks that you know, were built during Robert Moses' time um, and sort of got to know and got to work in all five boroughs, which was fantastic. Um, my father immigrated to New York uh, and he grew up there as a kid. So um, despite not my, growing up there myself, I really loved being in a city with so many folks from everywhere. It was great. And, um, and then I studied um, city planning and uh, urban design uh, and architecture at uh, Berkeley and then started working for the San Francisco Parks Department. I did not know that I was always gonna work for urban park systems, that wasn't like the plan, um, but it is, it is definitely gratifying to get to work um, in public space and I would definitely encourage, um, I know that you know, I've working, working in a public agency for a long time is, is very challenging, can be very disheartening, but it also can be fantastic and uh, learn a lot and get to really work on um, you know, community matters. So, does that make sense? Yeah, and when you talk about um, uh, what's satisfying, what gives you the greatest satisfaction from the kind of work you're doing at this point? And also, what's most frustrating? Oh. Okay, what's, um, I think it is, I think, I think the satisfying thing is when you find those those moments, those places where oh, they're going to spend thirty million dollars on this. Let's work with the community to try and make it be something great and not just you know whatever the government would do here. Um, and you know finding those places where you could actually impact something. Um, and and also 
I think a lot of times the, the, the public officials, the public agency staff that I'm working with in most places actually do want to do the right thing. Um, they often just don't have the time or the effort or the money or the, you know, the resources to do that. And so you know, with, with the Charles Gate project, um, sort of providing some of that assistance, providing some of that design assistance, providing some of that community support for that conversation, um, it's, it's a pretty great thing when you see uh, the public agencies and the community come together. That is really satisfying. Um, and, you know, and, and being there to listen, uh, to talk to people and engage with them and uh, really help focus them. Because um, sometimes, you know, sometimes it's sort of hard to, to communicate with uh, officials or public agencies that have very structured ways of, of working. And uh, sometimes I feel like I get to be an interpreter. And that's pretty fun in some ways. What's frustrating is, yeah, when you, when you see when government disappoints, you know, when it, you know, doesn't, it could do something, but it just sort of doesn't, or it does something in a way that, you know, isn't what, isn't what it could be. Um, you know, because I, I think government can be fantastic, um, and, you know, it, it is, and it can be really disappointing at the same time, so. That's hard, and then I think also figuring out, you know, what should our, what should public agencies be supporting versus, you know, foundations and nonprofits? You know, I think that's also a very, very open question. Um, but, it, but that is, it, right now, a lot of times it is through this, these public-private partnerships that we make things happen. You uh, described a meeting uh, early on in the process of celebrating Homestead where you and some other folks looked around the room um, and realized, or at least observed, um, that uh, basically the only people who were in the room were white, um, and I should also add uh, primarily professional, mm -hmm. um, and that they seemed to be the only ones who, who loved these parks, or at least had the authority to make decisions about them. Mm -hmm. That's not uncommon. Yeah. I mean, most of us sit in meetings where you look around the room and almost everyone who has any power or influence over policy making is white. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in fact, I, I think of my own experience where I've sat in rooms and until I saw another person of color uh, uh, sitting in the room on the other side of the room, it never even occurred to me that there was anything distinctive going on uh, because there are, uh, in policy making circles, so rarely uh, are there people of color who are part of that group. So you were sitting in a pretty typical meeting. So what changed the perception uh, within the Emerald Necklace uh, Conservancy um, that something needed to be different? I mean, why couldn't you just have gone ahead and held the Olmstead party and, and uh, celebrated it in the way most institutions do. Yeah, I, I think I think just you know, it's a great question. I think um, we were really I think trying to understand how we know that we know the users of the parks didn't look like that room. So that didn't match, you know. Um, perhaps decision makers or policy Policymakers did, um, but it was also in the middle of, of the, 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 or just at the beginning of COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement, and I think it really coalesced and intersected in a conversation in a really powerful way. I think that's part of it. Um, I think that the, I think that the Emerald Necklace Conservancy really did want to represent, and I think had thought perhaps that it was representing the neighborhoods all around the necklace. Um, but, but, but hadn't been able to do that in a really deep and authentic way. And so I think people also were interested in that. Um, and, uh, and I think we were also, you know, we are still a fairly young organization. We're only 25 years old and we were willing to do something different, you know, and, uh, and I think the organization said, you know, we could try this and if it works, great. And if it doesn't work, it's not the end of the world. Um, I think we didn't we didn't already have a preconceived notion of what the the bicentennial should be. I think that there probably is a standard, 
you know, I think a lot of conservancies and other organizations that sometimes are very focused on the physical, where both physical and policy and education were, were kind of span a few things. But a lot of times if you're focused on the physical or if you're a conservancy, we might think, well, let's raise money to rebuild a bridge or two. And that was sort of a natural thing, like let's focus on raising money to redo, redo something that is falling, falling down. But it just, it, it felt that year like we had to do something that was more about people. And I think that was probably related to COVID and probably related to Black Lives Matter and just sort of thinking about, you know, heck, if this is the end of our lives, like don't we want to like do something that's fun and like with people? I think that was part of it too. I, you were there for some of that, Ted. Do you, do you remember what sort of changed? I remember you were encouraging us to, to work with, with the youth and that was always a really strong theme in, in, the, um, in the thinking and in the, the planning and the, the community work. Yeah, and, and Boston's youth are um, largely people of color. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the issues that always comes up, uh, particularly in a uh, trustee board, is how will you continue the organization beyond the service terms of the people who are already there? Um, who do you bring on uh, to make sure that the organization continues um, after the uh, present folks um, have served out their terms or moved away or done whatever. Um, and clearly it, it was uh, obvious to us um, that the organization could continue to recruit people who were exactly like the people who'd always been there, um, but that they would not uh, really represent the interests of the people who were using the parks. Tell us about who uses the park. Well, so yeah, so the, the you know, Boston is majority minority city, which is actually contradictory in terms, just. Yeah, we never like that. Right? Yeah. So, um, you know, majority people of color, uh, communities of color, and, um, and it's important to think about, you know, communities that use and need all of the parks in the, in the Boston park system. And the Emerald Necklace isn't the entire, you know, Boston park system, but it is about half of it. It's a lot of it. So, you know, if you yeah, have- Yeah, I mean, you're not the parks department. We are not the parks department, no. We are, uh, the, 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 the parks are officially, you know, the responsibility is with, with public agencies, but we supplement them. We provide a lot of, um, of tree care, of education, and run the, the visitor center, and it's all through essentially um, donations of individuals, foundations, um, et cetera. You know, actually, Ted, now that I'm reflecting, um, you know, I think that I think that one of the main things that really shifted Olmstead now to be what it is um, versus sort of a kind of like bridge restoration project was um, was the Christian Cooper incident. I don't know if, um, if 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 you all followed that, but in Central Park, um, a, an African American birder, um, and you know, an expert, uh, was threatened by a, a white woman who, um, when he suggested that she lease her dog, which is, by the way, the law. Uh, she said that she was gonna call the cops and say that a black man was threatening her. I, I don't remember if that was exactly the words, but those essentially were the words. And, um, and I was in conversations with you and with um, Philip Bar Bar Barish and um, Kenny Bailey and Stephen Gray, and we started saying, well, we need to talk about this. This is, this. we need to figure out what we're gonna do with this. And we had a panel, there was a panel discussion at the Boston Foundation called um, uh, Black Space, uh, White Space, White Space, Green Space, that all space is white space. And actually realizing that and, and thinking about that. And actually that was, that was Kenny's, that was Kenny's thought. And he was sort of going on, because he was brilliant. And, and he, was, he said that and he kept going, he's like, no, 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 we have to just talk about that. Because like a lot of people don't even get that part of it. And he's African American. Yes. Okay, go on. Um, and, and so it was, it was, I think a lot of it was through that conversation and, um, and just realizing how we really needed to, you know, really explode things. Yeah, you know, a key question that came up, and, and I'd appreciate your response to this, is one around who feels like they own the parks, right? We all go into parks. By and large, we don't have to pay to go into a, a park. Mm -hmm. uh, it's viewed as an open space like the street. But some people feel as though they own parks, and other people feel like they're just visitors. So 
part of the question was, how do you enable people who feel like they're visitors, even though they're using the park a lot, how do you enable those people to feel like they're stakeholders, like they're owners? Uh, the, the white community folks on the board and, and um, in many of the parks um, were very proprietary about their sense of whose park it was. And uh, the, bl the black and brown people who uh, were using the same parks, often even more, you know, when they uh, took their kids in and uh, uh, played cricket on the weekends and, and uh, played basketball and what have you, always felt like they were visitors to someone else's park. So the question became, how do you convert someone who feels like a visitor into an owner? Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, it's, it's very interesting. There are definitely, I think, a lot of really strong ties to Franklin Park um, as being a, a park, I mean, has an amazing history. When I learned, I learned, I mean, these are all things that I learned recently, which I'm kind of surprised if I've worked in urban parks for this long, how is it like, I'm just learning these stories now. But there was a, you know, sit-ins was something, you know, the civil rights movement that I learned about that happened in the South. There was, there were wait-ins here where, um, you know, communities, uh, individuals of color gathered in Franklin Park and then went out to the beaches and essentially, uh, you know, ha had to force integrate um, the beaches, which were um, heavily segregated. And these are the beaches on Boston, Boston Harbor. Yeah. I mean, these are beaches that, that any of us at any point in time could just hop on a bus and, and get out to Carson Beach and um, be on the waterfront, you know, for the cost of a, a, a bus ride. Yes, so, so Franklin Park, I think, has a very strong, uh, a, a very strong relationship to um, the communities of color that surround it. Um, but you know how decision making happens on any space. You know who gets to decide. You know where is where a playground is built. If uh, you know if a if a piece of park should be a building or should become a park. Those are all sort of questions that I think are um, you know that are that are still being written. I'd say one one example of this uh, and the work that we've been doing with Olmstead now is that we did not require all the applicants that submitted for grants to already have all the permissions to do the projects in the park, which is often something that a grant will require. But that, that often you know, cuts out folks that don't already have relationships with all of the permitting agencies and all of the, the folks. So we knew that we were, at, at times we probably would need to help, but also teach or just connect people better. And there definitely were a couple of projects that when agencies originally like got the application, like, oh no, 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 this doesn't happen here. This kind of music is in play here, or that is something that is done in a different type of park. And um, you know, I don't think I don't think that, that staff realized that they were that these were racialized reactions, but they often were. And um, so a lot of the work that you know we, we are doing right now is is really creating those habits, those partnerships, and those patterns. So these spaces, because they are, in fact, everyone's space. They are public parks, they're everyone's space um, that people are, are, are connected to. Because um, once, you, you know, because we do, in, in urban parks, there is this, there's a system of permissions that, um, that underlies uh, how parks are used. Have you ever done any analysis of who uh, uh, gets those permits and who doesn't? I have not, but that would be a very interesting project uh, for anyone. Um, I mean, I think when I've worked in public, now I've worked in a couple of public park agencies, I've realized it feels like when you're on the inside um, that so much is actually dictated by like soccer parents. Um, you know, that so much of, of the noise and the feedback that park staff get are from those kinds of very active uh, very vocal users and sort of the passive users are just like folks and community members don't have the same kind of mic if that makes sense um, and because ball fields and those kind of that kind of team sports are very are not only very um, very loud very actively involved 
but also um, a lot of times people that were very involved in team sports end up working in parks departments. So it's like they sort of a cultural similarity between the families and the parents and the staff that have nothing to base that on other than pure observation, but it, it feels that way. Let me uh, shift the conversation just a little briefly um, to some of the ethical uh, uh, dilemmas that you struggle with um, and, and that we all struggle with around uh, use of the parks, but particularly these. Um, you mentioned that there is uh, a portion of Franklin Park which um, has been a, a hospital. What kind of hospital has it been? It's been a hospital that primarily serves Department of Corrections, um, uh, Department of Corrections individuals. Okay, um, and it's been there for how long? Since the, since the 50s. Since the 1950s. One of the things I learned incidentally was that Mike Dukakis, <laughs> after whom the Dukakis Center is named, former governor, um, uh, here in uh, Massachusetts, actually worked on that building physically <laughs> uh, as, as a construction worker. So he had a particular what has field he not board. touched? <laughs> um, yeah, he, he was, he was a, a young man, I think, in a summer was, was working on, on building it. And he's like, that was a bad idea then, and it's a bad idea now. Right. <laughs> so for many decades, there's been this hospital. It's been on the edge of the park, one of the edges of the park. Uh, not particularly close to um, public transportation. Um, uh, and it's been on what, 13 acres, you said? Yes, 13 acres. 13 acres, acres okay. Um, and it's, it's outlived its usefulness. And so um, public authorities uh, decided to shut it down, move the um, uh, residents of, of that place to a different location. Um, and Emerald Necklace decided to fight for having the site of the park, uh, of, of the hospital, uh, become a park again. Okay. Throughout this period, there's been a lot of discussion about what to do with people with opioid addictions who are living on the streets uh, on, on mass and cast. And at various times during uh, the Emerald Necklace's work to have this area returned to a park, the idea uh, came about, well, let's, let's just take these homeless opioid addicted individuals and put them in the Shattuck Hospital. So at one level, you're fighting for a park. At another level, uh, the appearance uh, emerged that you were against uh, working on behalf of the uh, well-being of um, uh, homeless people and people with uh, opioid addictions. How did the organization deal with that dilemma? It was extremely hard, uh, and it, because of course we, um, you know, we all live in cities. We all understand the challenges that um, all cities are facing right now. Um, all, my staff has Narcan training. Like we, we actually really get it. Like there's a serious need for these things, uh, and that's why we really wanted the state to, to you know, do the analysis to show that the Shattuck site was the, the right site. Um, but I think the way we've been trying to do that is not just sort of say no, this is terrible. We've been trying to develop other alternatives, and Northeastern um, has helped us to do that, and also. You know, when I think a lot of times policymakers say, oh, this is a really easy solution, we can just do this. We, you know, sometimes part of our, our role is just to point out, like, actually, their plan still requires X number of years and X number of millions of dollars. And, you know, and also pointing out that when the state says these are really, really important needs, like so important, and then they fund them for zero dollars and zero cents, and instead suggest a 99 year lease that a private agency comes in and do it, does it. Um, so try to point out sort of the places where, um, you know, really the right thing isn't being done for the population that's trying to be served. Um, but it is, it's a tough place because the easy headline and the easy story is parks, you know, for fancy people or, you know, people on recreation and have free time versus, you know, the, the public health needs and housing for, you know, for folks that need it. 
and um, and that and that dialogue, you know, sells papers. It, you know, it, it reads well in a headline, but you know, complex conversations about opportunities and different ways of designing a site to incorporate multiple uses, like that doesn't roll off a tongue, and that doesn't like you know grab a headline. Um, so the the best way that we found was just to you know reach out to many of the communities around the park some of which had been engaged in the conversation but others that hadn't so it was clear that it wasn't just the emerald necklace conservancy that there were uh, organizations all around the park that also um you know didn't didn't um necessarily find the, the state's proposal um compelling and uh you know so that's that's i think the main way um you know we've been trying to do it and i think just you know also reminding people of, of the, you know, that we, we want all these things. You know, housing is important. You know, these needs are important. Uh, and it's a challenge because I, I, I think, you know, we don't want to be an organization that's just like, we only want to talk about parks and we don't care about any other issues. Um, but, you know, some people could say, well, actually, that's all we're supposed to talk about. That's what we're, our organization is. We're supposed to be about the parks. Um, maybe I'm undermining the power of the organization by even considering the other issues, you know? I struggle with this actually, um, you know. And I, uh, you, you know, right now, when we look at projects that are new development that is being proposed in and around the necklace, and uh, community members are asking for that that housing or those projects to be denser and bigger and provide more affordable housing, that's great. But it also means that more shadow might be cast on the necklace. You know, is that for me to care about? You know, should I just let uh, housing advocates worry about that and just try and stay in the park lane? Or do I realize that this is, you know, this is a big complex, complex city that we're trying to run? And let, let me ask a, a related question, uh, without naming names. Uh, the Conservancy for a long time was thought of as uh, primarily white, uh, kind of Brookline, uh, Beacon Hill um, organization. Um, you had to approach, in order to engage community, uh, a number of elected officials, uh, both uh, black and white. So without naming names, what, was, what were the kinds of responses that you got from those people who are elected to make policies around these kinds of issues? Well, it, it really varied. It really varied. Um, we had, you know, I. I don't know if there were any trends in terms of race in terms of the responses we got, but definitely in terms of experience. So one of the elected officials that we reached out to had themselves had addiction issues and really, you know, really felt strongly about um, this type of housing. And we agreed. And at, at times when we said, oh, we can find space on the Arbor Way site, um, folks said, oh, great, let's do that and the Shattuck site. Um, you know, so, and that's where a lot of people, you know, felt was, was, was important. Other, other folks were very excited about the Shattuck site as a development possibility for, for all kinds of income housing, not just um, housing for the formerly homeless. The deed actually won't allow for that, but I think there were some of the elected officials that thought there was a real, you know, possibility for, um, for development. And, and you know neighborhood development housing those kinds of things yeah generating revenues uh, from uh, market rate housing yes uh, tax revenues and um, you know putting housing in the middle of a, of a park uh, just a quarter of a mile from a golf course <laughs> yeah. you don't get to do that in the city very often yeah so it was it was you know definitely varied reactions um, there was a lot of there were a lot of elected officials that were sort of the end of their Herb and sort of retiring, so there was also, I don't think we had, there hasn't been really strong elected leadership sort of working with the MBTA, which is obviously an agency going through a lot of challenges right now, or, you know, sort of, you know, HHS, so the, the housing and, uh, you know, and services organization that was, um, health, health organization that was, you know, dealing with the, the transition of the Shattuck site. So, um, you know, some parts of the city, uh, definitely the Charles Gate project, very, very strong state uh, elected leaders. But I think that that Shattuck sort of fell between sort of areas of focus um, for some, you know, many of the elected officials and it hasn't sort of gained the same kind of attention, I think. And it's really complex and takes time and, you know, nobody wants to be anti-services or anti-housing and they worry that even questioning the, the project 
um, might be read that way. Can you uh, describe in a little bit of detail, and, and then we'll um, open up for uh, conversation, but could you describe in a little bit of detail um, what kinds of work the Northeastern students um, have done on these projects? Uh, you, you have used the term Northeastern a number of times, but in fact it really wasn't Northeastern the institution, it was uh, students. Yes. Uh, whose work contributed to uh, what you've been trying to do. So you want yeah. to talk about that? Yes, yes. So um, Northeastern graduate students through the Capstone pro uh, program uh, provided two or three different reports for us. Number one, they provided a, a study and they analyzed sites all around the, the Franklin Park area for other publicly owned or other sites that could be used. So that was a great report, sort of showed how the Arbor Waste Yard site was uh, potentially one of the most um, most viable uh, in terms of size and uh, proximity and sort of other other aspects of that site. Um, and the the second the second study um, took the took the the essentially the mass of the Franklin excuse me of the Arbor Way Yard site and sort of showed how different things could fit within and around it using the the parameters provided by the MBTA. So really doing sort of more of a spatial study. So we worked with uh, landscape architecture and architecture students, uh, urban, urban planning students to uh, develop that. Um, and there was also, also that studio uh, produced some physical models that we were able to use uh, in a meeting with some community members and I think we're still gonna be able to use. I don't think this is not the end of the road for this conversation. Um, and through those, through those models and through these, these renderings, we were able to talk to people about other possibilities and sort of show them those, which we wouldn't have had um, had we not had uh, those tools. Because it's, it's pretty hard just to sort of imagine, you know, what you're saying about, you know, this piece of land can be used in these ways. And so the Northeastern students uh, really did that. They also um, did another study that sort of helped us think about some of the sort of legal and other it, it implications around uh, around the project, um, so it was, it was great. Yeah. So your your work as students uh, definitely not only feeds into but influences policy making uh, for uh, groups such as the Conservancy. Uh, let's open for questions or uh, comments or thoughts that folks may have. Yeah. 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 Um, you spoke a lot. Yeah, you spoke a lot to the political disaggregation and control over the lands, like that you guys are conservancy over. Um, given the unique demographic circumstances um, and what that may implicate for elected officials and bureaucrats in those jurisdictions, um, how do you guys go about navigating those when you consider like your mission towards more racial equity and, and those goals you were talking about? Yeah, I mean, that's that's, that's the that's the whole challenge. Um, we try and develop sort of goals and projects, and then work with all three agencies. One of the ways we've been I mean, one example that we've been most successful in was when you know all the this, this happened started before my time. I've been with the Conservancy six years, but starting um, in 2014, the Conservancy you know had had realized how how much the tree care of the entire bull necklace wasn't taken care of. And um, you know, the best practice for urban tree care is to essentially have a GIS database uh, and you know, catalog all the trees and, uh, and work to improve them all over a certain number of years. And seven years is a, it's a pretty generally accepted cycle for that. And so the Conservancy developed a plan and met and worked with all three agencies, and I think it was a very long, drawn out process that involved many, many meetings, uh, and actually got to a place where we have signed, uh, you know, MOUs, uh, memorandums of understanding agreements with all three public partners to pay for half of all the tree care over multiple years. And I don't know if people really thought, well, is the Conservancy gonna be able to raise that kind of money? And because we were smaller then, um, but we have now raised, we, we, have, we have spent over, you know, two, two and a half million dollars on tree care, which is like tree pruning. It's not that sexy. It's 
kind of amazing that you know donors were interested in doing that and in in you know not you know I've seen that happen in other cities when usually people pay to like take care of the park like right outside their window but to 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 sort of think about that as a as a system wide thing I think was really admirable that was one of the reasons I wanted to come here so that was pretty pretty cool um, and so that's one example but that is a multi year project and it requires a tremendous amount of focus and that was before like tree care was really on the brain. I think it was sort of before people were thinking about the urban fo urban forest and heat islands and all of the needs to take care of trees. I mean, the good news is, is that we have a pretty great urban forest in and around the necklace and we have to keep caring for it. We have to keep investing in it. It means that, you know, we have those benefits right around the necklace, but there also are huge parts of Boston that doesn't have um, that kind of resources, but now, those same, actually some of the consultants we work with have now developed a tree plan for Brookline and Boston actually today, but this morning I think it was, uh, announced its uh, urban forest plan has come out and they also have, uh, are, have um, digitized uh, and essentially uh, mapped uh, a lot of the, of, the, of, their urban, of the urban forest here in Boston too. But there is not yet a plan I think to take care of all of those trees over, over the, the period of time that is is probably most recommended. I have a specific question about the Harbor Way site. So I know there's so many factors at play here, and the, the site has a huge potential for them to be a happy environment for the fleet, but there's also been a lot of quality of <coughs> concerns in the neighborhood, and then you have your conflicting priorities with electrifying the fleet, say, providing housing for people who need it, and also preserving our space. Mm -hmm. And I know that a, a point of view that I've seen is, is taking folks who need housing, but just putting them on, on the setting of bus yard, which is a few ways, <coughs> and it's a pretty, a pretty chaotic place to live. So how do you balance all of those concerns when you know, space is limited and opportunities are limited to do a project? Well, it's it's a it's a big site. It's like it's 19 acres. It, you can fit the Fenway, you know, you can fit Fenway in the site. So there 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 I think there are lots of ways that architects can you know develop and build sort of like more human scale buildings and uh, and the electrified bus facility. I think right now it's pretty clear that he's sort of trying to figure out how big and how you know at one point they said 200 buses. Now they're saying more um, to have swing swing space for, for for other facilities that would go down, and so I think there's a, a lot of sort of planning and finalization that needs to be done of that. But there had been an agreement in place to essentially provide eight acres of the site for neighborhood development, and so it's it's up for the city and others to sort of decide what that should be. But also the the T's working assumption. Is, is essentially one building that is a electrified bus facility. It doesn't have retail around it, it doesn't have housing above it, it doesn't sort of integrate you know, and, 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 and feel urban. Um, you know, and, and in a lot of other cities, you know, now that you have electrified buses, it's not, they're not like gas buses. You don't have to have everything open. It doesn't have to have the same kind of ventilation requirements that you have for gas buses. So now that you can wrap an electrified bus facility and other things, Maybe we should be doing that. Yes, it is more complex, but do we need to build an income stream in for the T? Yeah, I think we do. So, um, you know, I think design can can bring us uh, other ideas if we're willing to, you know, think more creatively. And then, as kind of a follow up, I know you mentioned that you want to build on this other funding stream, but where does most of the funding come from, and how does that inform your priorities in your policy? It's, I mean, it's, it's individuals, it's foundations, it's, it's, a, it's a blend. Uh, grants, you know, different, different things. Um, you know, I don't, it's a great question. I think that, you know, donations that go to the tree program go to the tree program, but for the most part, we are, we are, we respond to um, community members and others and, that, and priorities that, that come up. So the Muddy River was flooded, that's what we focus on. Um, the, the trees needed work, sort of implementing and, and fixing that. I think um, the one of the main the main drivers for a lot of the work that we need to do is is often those areas that need work. 
and uh, you know it's not necessarily um, you know doesn't always correspond with perhaps the neighborhood which um, you know the neighborhood's request we have to like try and make sure that those things align as much as possible um, I'm trying to think if there's a good way to sort of illustrate that um, I mean for the most part you know there, there aren't situations where where someone's like hey let's fund this and so you need to do that that doesn't you know that doesn't actually really happen um, as much as you might think uh, I think instead what 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 happens is you have a park that is really run down and it needs work you know in a lot of areas and then so you sort of try and figure out you know what funding is available what community groups are most actively asking about this and how do all these things you know sort of intersect and to find find the things that have momentum behind them you know and you raise the um, question about neighborhood acceptance uh, a partial answer to your question about um, uh, creating residential facilities in a neighborhood that might not uh, be as uh, quiet or calming as, as others um, is that that particular neighborhood has shown a willingness over the years uh, to um, accept housing um, developed for individuals, homeless individuals and uh, opioid addicted individuals um, and the moment you start to uh, say, well, let's put it in another neighborhood that might be quieter and the like, the first thing you encounter is neighborhood opposition. Uh, you know, we found over the years in Boston that people object to having halfway houses in their neighborhoods. They uh, have objected to having housing for uh, uh, battered women uh, in their neighborhoods. And um, uh, often, uh, when that happens, uh, those same people will say, I agree with this in principle, but I don't want these people on my block. Um, and um, they, they become vociferous opponents uh, of the relocation. And so you end up spending a lot of your time um, fighting the neighbors who say that they are supportive of uh, city programs or state programs that uh, address those needs as long as they're somewhere else. Um, and, and that becomes a key element of uh, 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 policy uh, uh, throughout this process. And again, it goes back to uh, why it is uh, that uh, we saw a highway with the uh, large exhaust stacks um, expanded and run through Chinatown. Uh, the question was, uh, what do you do with the road that's already there at some level um, with a local population that may or may not object to it. And if it doesn't appear that you're going to run into major political um, objections, the road goes through. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned a lot of success when working on policies for Charles State Park, but then a lot of struggles when working with Franklin Park. I was curious what specific components or like factors of the political and legal landscape led to your policy success when fighting to revitalize Charles Gate Park and how those tactics could be applied to policy conversations. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think there was more um, political support around the Charles Gate sites and more elected officials that were more clued in and more interested in supporting um, those kind of changes, but I also think that the the Charles Gate project, we were able to start working with community members before the state came up with a plan to redesign the roadways. Um, we didn't have kind of, we didn't realize, you know, I hadn't heard, um, and I don't think it had been, you know, decided that the, the state was going to be ripping down the Shattuck Hospital. So the state sort of already had a plan when they came out. Whereas um, the Charles Gate project, we had, we had started working with the neighborhood and then we heard, oh, that bridge is in bad shape. Oh, the state's thinking about changing it. And we also were able to hire actually a uh, professor here, uh, Dan and Marie Adams, who are both uh, partner, uh, partners with a firm called uh, Landing Studio, their firm. 
and they have been working on the heart of the park and it also worked with MassDOT in the past and I think those kinds of um, professional relationships, um, agencies that have worked with uh, certain service providers um, and in the, in the Shattuck situation, we have definitely been more of um, an advocate. We were not able to, we did not have forewarning so we couldn't sort of develop plans far in advance of the project um, and we were also, it, it's a very, they are very different in the sense that there was no losers with Charles Gate. Like there was no, like we, we made sure to try and uh, maintain all, in, in all of the iterations of the design so far, all of the exits and on-ramps for cars. And we're adding pedestrian and bike facilities, but we're not eliminating car facilities. We trying to make sure all of the parties are satisfied. Um, and there, and there isn't a real, you know, it, there aren't these real trade-off conversations in the way that um, the Shattuck project has. And the state had already been planning on investing many million, millions, millions of dollars into Charles Gate, and so now we're just encouraging them to do something a little different, a little more, whereas at the Shattuck, we're like, actually, we are proposing you not do what, you, what you're planning on doing and go to a different site. So it was, you know, the, the state already felt like it had a plan, um, and, and we were we were suggesting that that change as opposed to just sort of do it a little differently. Well, and I, I guess I will also say, you know, the, the, the community was, uh, I think, a lot more um, engaged and affluent around Charles Gate, and they had more relationships with their elected officials and were able to probably also encourage them to be more involved in a different way than uh, the Franklin Park, uh, the Franklin Park communities, which we, we we had a lot more elected officials to try and rally, but um, but with weaker ties, I think, to to many of the community members. Could could you just uh, elaborate a little bit more on some of the um, economic class distinctions that you've run into around trying to mobilize folks? I mean, in Charles Gate, you have a fairly affluent community. Well, I think actually the area around Charles Gate is more economically diverse than you would think. But the the community, I mean, these kinds of projects, you know, that just take all kinds of volunteer time. The folks that are with me week after week in meetings, talking to the Parks Department, talking to the State Transportation Department, those are folks that you know have the time and resources to spend time, you know, and uh, and. And, and influence things and you know call their elected officials and, and do those sorts of things whereas um, you know the, the work in in Franklin Park um, I definitely have you know there definitely are folks that are very engaged and in fact there was an article recently quoting a lot of the community members that have been uh, you know really aligned with some of the things we've been working towards um, you know but, but they work full-time they don't have the the time and the um, to spend on, on these things and so a lot of times I feel like I'm sort of speaking, you know, with with their proxy on behalf of certain things, but you know, it, it's it's hard to for me to represent sort of all the community members that I, I, I that I think um, that I think would be interested in this, and um, you know, and we we have ways that we try and sort of show community intent with sort of sign on letters and other things like that, but real community work and organizing work and sort of developing new plans just takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, a lot of persistence, and also really sometimes designing and showing a new vision. Like, you know, there's a, you know, you, it's, it's, it, the value in sort of putting forward another future alternative in drawing form or in rendering um, is very powerful. And um, we were able to do that with Charles Gate because we got some early grant funding, but also, because there was a real possibility to do that. Doing that at Shattuck was sort of seen as a direct contradiction to what the state was proposing. And, and, and much of the affordable housing community, which was very, very uh, supportive of the state's plan, it, it, it felt like you know, we were sort of anti-housing or anti-affordable housing by trying to propose an alternative. That also goes to a uh, conversation that we had uh, in our uh, earlier session uh, around what matriculating students' deliverables might be. That is to say, 
you might write a paper, but you might do something that's much more graphic in nature uh, because you find that that is a more uh, persuasive way of um, uh, selling the idea that you're putting forward. So uh, we want to be open-minded about um, what it will take for you to present to someone you may not know, probably don't know, uh, a compelling idea that uh, encourages them to change their thinking about uh, environmental justice. Yes. Um, I'm just starting to learn about all this. I've started to read about Olmsted in preparation for this lecture. And I read that he was unable to achieve some of his goals in designing Central Park, like class integration. And I wonder, um, do you think parks can be the impetus for social transformation? Uh, I, I mean, I would like to think that they could be. I'd like to think that, you know, and Olmsted talked about people of, of all walks of life coming together and being seen coming together. I think those are his words, and I think that, that is a really important part of the American experience. Um, and, you know, and I, I do think that that can happen. I, I think that we, we do have a tendency, particularly since the 1950s, of creating sort of quiet parts of parks and you know busy parts of parks and places that have this kind of need and this kind of need. Uh, and I think, and and really, you know, coming up with facilities or or, or changes or investing in parks in such a way that that everyone feels welcome doesn't always happen. Um, and you know, maintenance and the, the ways that we, have, we are not funding basic maintenance in a lot of cities because of the way um, public, public resources are allocated to parks. You know, parks receive what, usually less than 1% of a city's budget does in Boston. And if you, and also this, on, the state, on the state level, if the parks aren't in a good good shape or don't seem to be cared for, then that can feel like it's communicating something to the park users. Oh, this isn't a very nice park, or it's not safe, or it's not well cared for, um, doesn't feel welcoming, doesn't have bathrooms, or doesn't have those kinds of facilities. So um, I'd like to think that you know we can all kind of come together, and that could be like a truly equal, free space. But I think um, you know the, the the landscape is is actually quite varied. And, and um, our parks in, in Boston um, can sometimes be very surprising in the diversity that you find in them. Uh, when you drive up to the uh, uh, outer edges of East Boston, for example, um, a neighborhood that has traditionally been thought of as either old Italian or more recent uh, Latinx, uh, one of the first things you see is uh, numbers of uh, Muslim mothers in hajib with their kids uh, walking along the, um, uh, the beachfront there. Uh, when you get out into the parks, you find that uh, people use them in uh, a wide variety of ways. Um, and to a large extent, uh, there really is a feeling that um, people who live in those immediate areas uh, have a sense of ownership um, uh, of those parks. And depending upon who lives there, uh, demographically, uh, the, the park use is uh, quite extensive. The other thing I would just say is that, at least in terms of uh, national standards, Boston now has, what, the first or second uh, most accessible parks of any city in the United States. And we don't necessarily think of it that way, but the, the standard, the metric is um, how many parks are there within a 10 minute walk of where you live? And we have so many small parks. I mean, you know, even here, which uh, sometimes feels uh, like, uh, you know, a real city, um, 10 minutes from here are the fence um, and, and a river that you can actually you know, see uh, a waterfowl out. Um, and, and, you know, right there, uh, not that far from Fenway Park, uh, is, uh, is the Charles River. Um, so 
uh, access to the parks is extensive and the people who feel comfortable using those parks um, can be very varied, but that doesn't mean that they're not largely segregated by race. So for example, if you go to um, a concert on the Esplanade, the likelihood of seeing people of color there is fairly remote. Uh, yet you go to Franklin Park, um, and uh, you know there's kind of a mix of folks, and certainly a big mix of cultures who use that park. Um, but many of the parks are still um, reflective of, of who lives in those neighborhoods, and therefore, since Boston is a is a uh, residentially racially segregated city, um, the usage uh, doesn't reflect the city as a whole. I think the, the Esplanade is, is an interesting example though because it has a transportation aspect. So it isn't necessarily just about uh, the communities that live in and around it. And I think this year, um, I think the last couple of years, the Esplanade Association also has sponsored some new programming. But I think sometimes that is in order to really, you know, change um, you know the, 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 the kinds of events and activities that people are used to seeing in a park you really have to be very deliberate about sort of finding uh, ways to sort of invite you know different and when it, it is very interesting you know that certain types of music I don't, there was a piece on the radio about about our program and one of the one of the grantees was saying that the that the insurance company wouldn't give them insurance because they wouldn't give insurance to um, music that was rap or hip hop, you know, and so it was, you know, just like these clear, clear ways that we were essentially deciding what types of music could even be, um, be performed. But you gave me an, a wonderful opportunity to plug our Parks Fest event because this, this is the idea that you know we everyone should feel invited. You know, if you maybe maybe someone that would come to the park for this event would then come back again and sort of would feel like the park. Is, is something that's more, um, more able for them to see. And I, I do point out, and I talk about the fact that all of these sites will have porta-potties, and everyone's like, why do you brag about porta-potties? Um, because, you know, really just basic things like bathrooms, water fountains, those really basic things mean that a family uh, with, can, can go and stay for longer. So uh, I was chair of a restroom task force once, I don't wanna brag, um, but you know, Little kids, small legs, you know, can't plan, but also, you know, people of all ages need to have restrooms, and it means that you can stay at a site for longer, uh, if there's food, if there's those kinds of things. And a lot of times, I think, we create these very sterile parks that don't always have all these activities, and then, you know, a family can't um, be there for longer, or you can't squeeze it in between your first job and your second job that day. Um, you ne really need to have uh, those kinds of amenities. So there will be porta potties all the locations on Saturday. Yeah, we have time for one or two more. Barbara. I just wanted to ask about the muddy river pollution. Is there any way to or attempt to remediate the whole E. coli problem? So it, it's a great question. Um, there, oh, did I say, talk about the reeds, the Phragmites? Those are the big, tall reeds that actually are being removed in, in some places now. Um, actually, most of the places now. So you might, you, you'll start to see the river more and more. Hopefully it will stay visible. Hopefully we'll be able to keep the phragmites from growing back. They will keep growing back and we will have to keep treating them. But um, this is a, this is a, big, a big push. Um, so uh, in terms of the muddy river and the E. coli, um, I mean, I think there are all, there's a lot of things we can do to improve the, the water quality. And we're working with organizations like the Charles River Watershed Association. There's also, uh, an, another group um, that has more recently started doing specific interventions, the Muddy Water Initiative, that um, has been uh, experimenting with some uh, filtration devices that are put directly in the water to see how that affects uh, phosphorus and other levels, and that testing is ongoing now, so I don't know exactly how well that's working. Um, but I think anything that can increase flow and, for, you know, and also manage a lot of the runoff, um, if, if any of you would like to take a tour of Charles Gate Park uh, and the existing conditions there now, we offer, we have tours of that. You can see, you know, the pipe coming directly off the interstate 
directly into the river, um, which, is, which is not a condition that today's environmental standards would permit. But they were permitted before, uh, when that when the when all of these, you know, major infrastructure pieces were originally built. So if we can just you know take a lot of that runoff and and route it through green spaces, and so they can be cleaned before it gets into the river, that would that would help. Um, there also are places that you know sewage is directly, um, you know, the, many of the the illegal connections of sanitary sewer to the muddy river have have been been uh, corrected over time, but there probably are still some, some uh, instances of that. But these are all things that need to be, um, you know, essentially, you know, parsed out and sort of figure out where all of the pollution is coming from. And there are, um, there are conversations right now with, well, you know, all the different public agencies that are um, affect, you know, affected uh, by this to see what are the ways that that can be done. But it, it takes, it's, it is going to take, take, take some time, some time. Let's thank uh, Karen and thank you for having me. Uh, one or two uh, uh, quick uh, logistical announcements. Um, we will not meet next Monday because it's Rosh Hashanah, um, and uh, we're respectful of um, uh, holy days. Um, those of you who uh, have expressed an interest in working on the uh, mass horticultural project, um, have an opportunity to uh, meet at least uh, briefly uh, with the contact person. Janet Alberto is in the back of the room um, and she's been looking forward to connecting. And if it's a project that you uh, are thinking that you might want to connect with but uh, haven't expressed an interest in yet, um, She's here, uh, and you can uh, talk to her. Um, and then we will reconvene next Wednesday at our normal time and place uh, to uh, have uh, further discussion uh, of the projects that you'll be working on. And I'll want to see um, at least a draft proposal uh, for what it is you're thinking about working on and any partners you might be thinking of working with. Uh, a week from Monday, not this coming Monday, but a week from Monday. So you have uh, about 10 days to uh, uh, shape up your draft proposals. Are there any other questions or comments for this evening? Once again, let's thank our uh, teaching assistants for the great job that they did. And uh, we'll see each other next week. <laughs>